This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2021. Lesson one from the series Present Truth in Deuteronomy, ready for teaching on October 2. It's titled Preamble to Deuteronomy, and I'm Percy Harold. And before we begin this series of lessons, let's read the introduction written by the author, Clifford R. Goldstein, who is the editor of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide and author of numerous books, including Baptizing the Devil, Evolution and the Seduction of Christianity. The series is titled The Book of the Covenant, Deuteronomy. The story goes like this. During the reign of King Josiah in Jerusalem from 640 to 609 BC, someone probably working in the temple found a copy of a book, and the book was read before King Josiah. Now it happened, we read in 2 Kings 22.11, when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Why? Because he realised that he and his people were not obeying what was written in the book. Then, on the basis of that book, called the Book of the Covenant, in 2 Kings 23, verse 2, Josiah began a great reformation. We can read about that reformation in 2 Kings chapter 23. What was the book that had such an impact on the king and his nation? It is believed to be Deuteronomy, our study for this quarter. The fifth and last of the five books of Moses, Deuteronomy, a name that comes from the Latin word Deuteronomium, which means second law, could be summarised as follows. Having left Egypt, and having entered into the covenant at Sinai with the Lord, the children of Israel, instead of going directly to Canaan, wandered in the wilderness for forty years. When the forty years were finished, and the Hebrews were finally about to cross over to the Promised Land, Moses spoke to them in a series of speeches. The essence of those speeches was, You're now about to enter the Promised Land, finally. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you, and don't forget what He asks of you now, which is to love Him with all your heart and soul, and to reveal that love by obedience to all His commandments, all according to the covenant. And, to stress the importance of the covenant, Moses repeated to the people the Ten Commandments, the legal foundation of their obligations in the covenant that the Lord had first cut with the fathers and again was doing so, but now with them, right on the borders of Canaan. Hence we ask, might there be parallels with what the children of Israel on the borders of the Promised Land faced? And what we today write on the border of the promised land, only a much better one, face as well? Thus, the topic for this quarter, which is called Present Truth in the Book of Deuteronomy, and that's what we're going to look at, present truth messages that we can take from God's word to his covenant people. In this quarter, we will look at Deuteronomy topically, covering such themes as everlasting covenant, law and grace, what it means to love God and your neighbour, and most important of all, how the book of Deuteronomy reveals to us the love of God, which was most powerfully made manifest in the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. Sure, a vast time and cultural divide separates our church today from the church in the wilderness, but perhaps what we have in common with them might be more than what divides us from them. For example, could not the following words be spoken to us as well today? Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Deuteronomy 4 verses 5 and 6. Notice, it wasn't the laws themselves that were their wisdom and understanding before the nations, but their obedience to those laws. Certainly, there's a message for us here, just one of many, as we will see in the book of Deuteronomy. Sabbath afternoon, September 25. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that 
not only do you love us, but you are love. And what your word teaches is more about you day by day as we open it. And as we open your word this week, as we come to it to find what you have for us, we pray that our hearts will be open and our minds clear and your Holy Spirit guiding us. We thank you, Lord, that wherever we're listening, whether it be in Invercargill in New Zealand or Dublin in Ireland or Anchorage in Alaska or Barbados in the Caribbean or Florianopolis in Brazil or Damascus in Syria or Harare in Zimbabwe or Lusaka in Zambia, that we can come to you and know that our salvation comes because of the death of Jesus and that your word not only guides us, but inspires us to follow you and to be more like Jesus. Bless us as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Let's read that again, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The book of Deuteronomy, of course, did not arise in a vacuum. As with everything in life, Deuteronomy exists in a context, and as with everything in life, that context plays an important role in understanding what the book means and what its purpose is. A lot of history came before it, a history that explained the circumstances, not only of the book itself, but also of the world and environment that created its context. Just as it would be hard to understand the purpose and function of a windshield wiper outside the context of a car, it would be hard to understand Deuteronomy, especially in light of our theme, Deuteronomy and the Present Truth, outside the context in which it arose. Someone had read Russian Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, about 1,500 pages, in just three days. When asked what the book was about, the reader replied, It's about Russia. To cover in one week's lesson the thousands of years of history before we come to Deuteronomy is to do somewhat the same thing. But, By focusing on the highlights, we can see the context needed to best understand this book, so rich with present truth. Sunday, September 26. Love to be loved. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 says, God is love. However simple these three words, there are four in Greek, the idea behind them is so deep, so profound, that we can barely grasp their implications. They don't say that God loves, or that God reveals love, or that God is a manifestation of love, but that God is love. Is love as if love is the essence of God's identity himself. As fallen human beings with only a few pounds of tissue and chemicals in our heads with which to grasp reality, we just aren't able to comprehend fully what God is love means. But we can certainly understand enough to know that it's very good news. If instead of God is love, the verse said God is hate, or God is vindictive, or God is indifferent, this revelation about him could have been something to worry about. And the truth that God is love helps us better understand the idea that God's government, how he rules all of creation, is reflective of that love. Love permeates the cosmos, perhaps even more than gravity does. God loves us, and we too are to love God back in return, as we read in Deuteronomy 6.5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and Mark 12, verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Love, though, to be love, must be freely given. God cannot force love. The moment he does, it's no longer love. 
Hence, when God created intelligent and rational beings in heaven and on earth with the ability to love, the risk always existed that they might not love him back. Some didn't, and hence there exists the origins of what we know as the Great Controversy. Why do the following text make sense only in the context of the freedom and the risk involved in love? Isaiah chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, and Ezekiel 28, verses 12 to 17. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings, that they might gaze at you. And Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Especially insightful is Ezekiel 28 verse 15, which shows that though this angel Lucifer was a perfect being created by a perfect God, iniquity was found in him. Let's read that verse. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. It was not because he had been created with that iniquity to begin with. Instead, created with the ability to love, Lucifer had true moral freedom, and despite all that he had been given, every precious stone was your covering, it had said, this angel wanted more. One thing led to another until, well, there was war in heaven. And so to finish the day. In some places you can buy robot dogs, which will obey your commands, never soil the carpet, or chew the furniture. Would you, however, have any kind of meaningful relationship with this dog? How does your answer help in understanding why God wanted beings who truly could love him back? Monday, September 27, The Fall and the Flood Almost every schoolchild has heard the story about an apple falling on Isaac Newton's head, and voila, Newton discovered gravity. Whether or not an apple really fell on his head isn't the crucial point. Instead, the point is that Newton's great insight... He didn't discover gravity either. Anyone who fell down already knew about gravity was to understand that the same force that dropped the apple, gravity, also kept the moon in orbit around the earth, the earth in orbit around the sun, and so forth. This was important because for millennia, many people believed that the laws that governed the heavens were different from the laws that governed the earth. Newton showed that this belief was wrong. 
And, though Newton's contribution was in the area of natural law, the same principles holds true with moral law. The same freedom, the freedom inherent in love that led to Lucifer's fall in heaven, led to humanity's fall on earth as well. Read Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 and Genesis 3 verses 1 to 7. How do these verses about perfect people in a perfect environment created by a perfect God also reveal the powerful truth of the freedom inherent in love? Genesis 2, beginning at verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. After the fall, things went from bad to worse, even to the point where the Lord said about humanity in Genesis 6 verse 5 that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And if their thoughts were bad, their actions surely were as well, until things got so evil that the Lord destroyed the entire world with the flood, in a sense giving humanity a chance to start over, a kind of second creation. However, as the story of the Tower of Babel shows in Genesis chapter 11, humanity still seemed intent on defying God. Genesis 11, beginning at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 119, we read, When the tower had been partially completed, a portion of it was occupied as a dwelling place for the builders. Other apartments, splendidly furnished and adorned, were devoted to their idols. The people rejoiced in their success and praised the gods of silver and gold and set themselves against the ruler of heaven and earth. End of quote. Thus, besides confusing their language, God scattered the fallen race across the face of the earth. So to finish the day, take a mental note of your thoughts throughout the day. What does this teach you about the state of your own heart?
Tuesday, September 28, The Call of Abram. Abram, later called Abraham, first appears in the genealogy of Genesis chapter 11, which comes right after mention of the scattering from Babel. We actually read the first time for Abram in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 27. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot, and Haran died before his father Terah in his native land, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, the call of God to Abram. Today, looking back after the cross, after the death of Jesus and the spreading of the gospel, how do we understand what God was promising to do through Abram? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Many centuries later, the Apostle Paul, in seeking to deal with the heresy of the Galatians, pointed back to Abraham's call, showing it to be an early expression of what God's intentions had always been, the gospel to the world, Galatians 3, verses 7 to 9. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Abraham's call was first expressed in Genesis 12. Much of the rest of Genesis is the story of his blood descendants, one dysfunctional seed after another, creating one messed up family after another, and yet through them the promise eventually was to be fulfilled reaching a crucial milestone with the call of Moses. Read Acts chapter 7, verses 20 to 36, the martyr Stephen's depiction of Moses and the Exodus. How does this fit in with God's initial promise to Abraham? Well, let's turn to that. This is Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 20. At this time Moses was born and was well pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed, and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand, and the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting, and tried to reconcile them, saying, "'Men, you are brethren.' Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbour wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then, at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when forty years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marvelled at the sight, and he drew near to observe. The voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out 
after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. In a world steeped in ignorance, error and a general lack of the knowledge of truth, things have not changed much in more than three thousand years, have they? The Lord called out a people, his people, Abraham's seed, from Egypt. In them, he sought not only to preserve knowledge of the truth, that is, knowledge of him, Yahweh, and the plan of salvation, but also to spread that knowledge to the rest of the world. So to finish the day. Today, how do we as Seventh-day Adventists see ourselves in relation to the rest of the world? That is, what parallels exist between us and ancient Israel? More important, what responsibility does this parallel place on each of us individually? Wednesday, September 29, The Covenant at Sinai The exodus and all that it entailed, from the blood on the doorposts in Egypt to the drama at the Red Sea, what an experience! No doubt it made an impression on those who lived through it. And those who died, from the firstborn children in Egypt to the soldiers at the bottom of the sea, God will judge them fairly. As the Lord said in Exodus 19, verse 4, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Why did the Lord do this stunning and dramatic rescue, actually taking one nation out of another nation, or as Moses himself said to them in Deuteronomy 4.34, or did God ever try to go and make for himself a nation from the midst of another nation, by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt, before your eyes. Read Exodus 19, verses 4 to 8. Why did the Lord call the people out from Egypt? Exodus 19, beginning at verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. It was as simple as that. God called them out, the seed, the descendants of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And with these descendants, the Lord established his covenant, and they would be indeed, as it said in verse 5, a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. This relationship was central to the covenant. This idea of special treasure, or segola, however, could be, and it was in fact, easily misunderstood. Their specialness came not from anything inherently holy and righteous in and of themselves. Instead, it was because of God's grace given to them, and because of the wonderful truths that he had bestowed upon them, truths that they were to follow, and, as a kingdom of priests, eventually spread to the world. God then gave them some of the stipulations of the covenant too, their end of the deal, so to speak, the Ten Commandments recorded in Exodus chapter 20. And then this covenant was ratified. Having sprinkled a newly constructed altar with the blood of the offerings, Moses took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, as it says in Exodus 24, 7. The people again declared that they would obey. Hebrews 9, 19 and 20 reads, 
When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. What does the blood signify? And why is it so important even to us today? Thursday, September 30. Apostasy and Punishment All that the Lord has spoken we will do, we read in Exodus 19, verse 8. And in Exodus chapter 24, verse 3, we read, So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And then in the same chapter, verse 7, Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Though no doubt the people had meant those words each time they said them, sacred history shows that, unfortunately, their actions time and again contradicted their words. Though they were the chosen people, though they had entered freely into the covenant with the Lord, they didn't keep up their end of the deal, which really came down to one thing. Question. What was the crucial component for Israel in regard to the covenant? Exodus 19 verses 4 and 5. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. The call to obey God, to keep his law, was no more legalism then than it is now. And yet again, and again, the children of Israel failed to keep up their end of the deal. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And John fourteen fifteen, If you love me, keep my commandments. And James two twenty, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith, without works is dead and romans chapter 6 verses 11 and 12 likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to god in christ jesus our lord therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts Indeed, early on, even in the very site of Mount Sinai itself, they fell into rank apostasy, as we read in Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 6. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made a moulded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Unfortunately, unfaithfulness seemed to be more the norm than the exception, and thus, instead of quickly entering into the promised land, they wandered in the wilderness 
for 40 years. Read Numbers 14, verses 28 to 35. What was the punishment meted out to the nation because of the people's refusal to trust what the Lord had told them to do? Numbers 14, beginning at verse 28. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from twenty years old and above, except for Caleb the son of Jephunneh, And Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. And they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Then, as now, so often disobedience occurs as a result not just of outright rebellion, though that does happen, but from a failure to trust in what God tells us. What made this sin even more heinous for Israel was the fact that, as God himself said, all these men had seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times, Numbers 14.22. Despite all that they had seen and experienced, they still refused to obey the Lord and to take the land, despite God's promises that they would succeed all the way through Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14. So to finish today, think about what was said above, that so often disobedience comes from a lack of trusting in God's word to us. Why is this true? And how can we indeed learn to trust in God more? Friday, October 1. For a deeper and well-thought-out study on the Great Controversy theme, based on the idea of God as love and written by a Seventh-day Adventist, see John Peckham's Theodicy of Love, Cosmic Conflict and the Problem of Evil, published in Grand Rapids, Michigan by Baker Academic in 2018. The fact that this work has been published by a non-Adventist press shows how good biblical scholarship can reveal the reality of the Great Controversy as depicted in Scripture. And there's a quote here from page 4. In brief, I argue that God's love, properly understood, is at the centre of a cosmic dispute and that God's commitment to love provides a morally sufficient reason for God's allowance of evil, with significant ramifications for understanding divine providence as operating within what I call covenantal rules of engagement. End of quote. And then from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 392. The decree that Israel was not to enter Canaan for forty years was a bitter disappointment to Moses and Aaron, Caleb and Joshua. Yet, without a murmur, they accepted the divine decision. But those who had been complaining of God's dealings with them, and declaring that they would return to Egypt, wept and mourned greatly when the blessings which they had despised were taken from them. They had complained of nothing, and now God gave them cause to weep. Had they mourned for their sin when it was faithfully laid before them, this sentence would not have been pronounced. But they mourned for the judgment. Their sorrow was not repentance and could not secure a reversing of their sentence. End of quote. 
And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Discuss the question of free will and love. Why must love, to be love, be freely given? Given all the suffering in the world, some would argue that love was not worth it. How would you answer that challenge? 2. With obedience so central to the whole Bible, what then is legalism? What factors can turn an attempt to be faithful to God and to his word and commandments into the trap of legalism? And three, in class, discuss the question asked at the end of Tuesday's study regarding the parallels between ancient Israel and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What are those parallels and why should we be concerned about them? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled I Met Jesus at the Shop. It's by Hong Soon Mi. It didn't seem that life could get much worse. My husband was stricken with bone marrow cancer. Then his parents died. I had to pay for my mother in law's funeral on my own and then take on responsibility for my family's livelihood. Sometimes I didn't even have 1,000 Korean won, that's one US dollar, to pay for my son's school supplies. My salary wasn't enough to cover my husband's hospital bills. Every day I worried that I wouldn't have enough rice to feed my family. I wept. I felt so alone. Then I met Park Yun Suk. She wasn't a relative or even a friend, but she tried to cheer me up. She saw that I was struggling financially and she gave me additional work at her shop in Hanam, a suburb of South Korea's capital, Seoul. The extra money helped pay for living expenses and hospital bills. I was so grateful for the work, but I noticed something unusual about Yun Suk. She seemed happier than other people. I thought this was strange, but I was greatly moved by her joy. As I got to know her, I saw that she went to church on Saturdays. She didn't worry about the income that she lost by closing her shop once a week. I was an atheist, but I wanted to go to church with her and find out why she had such joy and peace. Yun Sok never invited me to her Seventh-day Adventist church, but I resolved in my heart to go. So I started studying the Bible on my own. As I learned about God, the peace of heaven came into my life. I gave my heart to Jesus and joined West Hanum Seventh-day Adventist Church, where I now serve as a deaconess together with Yun Suk. There are many things that I don't know, but I believe in God from the bottom of my heart. Yun Suk never spoke to me much about Jesus, but I saw Jesus in her life. The same Jesus whom I met through her life is living in my heart today. This year, my husband and son also were baptised and joined the Adventist family. It doesn't seem that life can get much better. Thanks be to God for reaching my family through Yoon Suk and her shop. This mission story illustrates mission objective number one of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. To revive the concept of worldwide mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life involving not only pastors, but every church members. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org. This quarter, your 13th Sabbath offering will support two mission projects in South Korea. Read more about Yoon Suk, whose photograph appears here on the left, next week. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.